Uh, let's try to make it in formal workshops. So try to have like lots of discussions and ask questions. Uh, the program is light, uh, so uh, we can run a bit over time, and that's not a problem. We can also start a bit later in the next talk, so that we can have like 30 minutes long uh, break if we need. Uh, you can find the detailed program on our website, and also like uh, I put like a few uh, posters, like little posters with like some little talks and uh, little timelines. Uh, one thing that I want to remark is that there are a lot of people, which is good, but at the same time, not everybody could get a desk here at AI. And for those of you who don't have assigned desks, uh, there is an office room uh, book, uh, which is actually a nice office room. It's on the ground floor. Uh, it's zero to six. Like, we're very happy to begin with this track from uh, FQ here in Gashing. Who's going to tell us about continuous and discrete tensor networks and last page here? So, you take it away. Thank you very much. So, great pleasure for you to hear. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And so, the, I'm going to report on some work that we put together with some people in our institute. So, in particular, most of it, we're trying to collaboration with TSOR, which is going to come at some point, and I'm going to do that. of them are postdocs at the institute. And I will mention some other work which uh, Mari Carmen Valius, who's in the audience, who's also involved in traffic demos and the online activity activity. Okay, so I'm coming from the field of quantum information uh, theory, and we have seen during the last years that there are many connections with many body systems in many, in many, many areas. And uh, in particular, so one of the questions that we ask in quantum information is when we have uh, um, Multipartite state and many body state. So we ask questions so how, how much entanglement is it? And that's uh, the motivation for that from the point of view of quantum information is that quantum computers, you have many body states, are these qubits, which should be entangled in order to get some, some something from, from them. So uh, somehow the, the more entangled they are, then the better the computer is in a sense. And that's why we ask these kind of questions. And on the other hand, some people in, in many body physics work with some particular systems. So they try to think electrons, superconducting qubits, and something like that, and to build quantum computers with them. So that's one of the connections. But during the last years, there have been some of the connections arising, and one of them is in terms of tensor network, and that's the center of the, the, the that I would concentrate on, on my talk here. Okay, so the motivation, as I mentioned before, is that if we have a many body state, so for example, you have uh, somebody gives you a problem, it tells you that you have some particles that are interacting. This could be nest matter physics, atomic physics, or high energy physics. You put them on a lattice, and you would like to know what is the ground state of the system. So the state thermal equilibrium at zero temperature or at finite temperature. And this problem is very difficult because the Hilbert space of all these particles in your lattice has a dimension that grows exponentially with the number of lattice sides. So it's a huge. Hilbert space, and therefore, if we try to write wave functions in this Hilbert space, then we have to use exponential resources, so exponential time, exponential memory in our computers. However, it's very easy to see that actually that all most of the states in Hilbert space are completely useless because they will never be reached by by nature. So you start with some state, like it would be a product state, and then you evolve for let's say for a time that is the first only polynomial with the size of your system. Then you will just scan a, a tiny corner of Hilbert space, and in particular, if you have a ground state or a thermal state of a many-body system, and this many-body system or this the, the interaction that you have there are local or there are few body interactions, then actually your state has to be in this corner of Hilbert space, which is the one that is physically relevant. So, in fact, I mean sometimes you hear this this statement that the quantum computer is very powerful because it can scan a huge Hilbert space. That, that's, that's not true when a quantum computer works in some corner of Hilbert space. But in any case, so uh, since, since we know that actually from the whole Hilbert space that makes very difficult to address these many body quantum, si quantum systems, actually the physics is happening in a corner, in this physically relevant corner, so one can wonder, so can we just find some description for this that would be very good in this corner, but maybe not as good in the rest, that we don't care because the rest is not explored by nature. And in fact, so uh, you can try to identify what is this corner, and this is where this quantum information comes and says, so a question, so how, how much entangled is the state that you have? And it turns out that if your state is not very entangled, 
And actually, this is what happens in practice that all the states that are in terms of equilibrium of local with local interactions are very little entangled. Then uh, this identifies this corner of field space. Somehow, this corner of field space of interesting states, at least if we are in equilibrium, corresponds to states that are very little entangled. And this very little entangled is measured in terms of what is called the area law. So, the states that are there could feel an area law for the entanglement, for entanglement entropy. You take any region of this many of the system, any connected region, and you look at the entanglement between this region and the rest, instead of being an extensive property, instead of growing with the volume of the region, it, 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 it grows only with the surface area of this region. So that's the area law. And as I'm saying before, this identifies also this corner of field space, and this tells us that maybe we can find a description, which is not good in the rest of field space, but for states fulfilling this area law, for states that are physically relevant, that's a good description. That seems to be the case for tensor network states. So these tensor network states are aimed exactly at that. It is capturing the properties of this corner of Hilbert space. Let me introduce them very uh, briefly. So the whole idea is that if you have now this uh, method that I work most of the time in a, in a lattice, and at the end I will work in the continuous, we'll talk about quantum field theories at the end now, it's lattice systems. So you have a lattice, and you take a, a basis for your lattice. So you, for example, have spins in the vertices of your lattice, and you have a spin up and spin down, the simple systems. And you can write the many body state that you're looking after as a linear superposition of all possible basis states. And the coefficients here will be some complex coefficients that will depend on the configuration. So since there are, in this case of qubits, two to the n configurations, then you will have two to the n complex coefficients. And that's what makes difficult to describe the system. So a general state in this Hilbert state will have random coefficients would be here somewhere in the center. However, for this corner of Hilbert space, then these coefficients have some special form. Actually, they can be written in terms of small tensors that are contracted with each other along some what we call auxiliary indices. So this, qualitatively speaking, would say that this can be considered now as a tensor, which have all these indices and indices. And this big tensor, can be written as some smaller tensors, which depend on some of these indices, and some other indices which are contracted along these other indices. And you say, what is the advantage? The advantage is that in order to store a state like that, for example, in a computer, you will need to put to the end, uh, you, you have to store two to the end coefficients, whereas if you use these tensor networks, then actually you will have to store n tensors, one for each of your lattice side, but each of the tensors will have very few coefficients. So then, I mean, the effort grows like polynomial in them. This case would be proportional to n, not exponentially in n. Okay, so again, tensor network states are states for which the coefficients in some particular product basis, what we call computational basis, can be written as a, in terms of some smaller tensors that are contracted along some of the indices. And so I will be more specific later on. But in general, so instead of writing formulas like that, what we do is that we represent these formulas graphically in some notation, and that's what I want to introduce because I will use it during my talk. And I guess that some of the people talking about tensor networks will use similar notation. So, again, here we have these coefficients in a basis of our state, which can be considered as a tensor with these n indices. And so, we represent a tensor with some indices, some block which have some legs, and each for each of the legs, each of the legs corresponding. To some interest. So, for example, if I had qubits, I could have the state like spin down, so the coefficient corresponding to spin down, spin down, spin down, spin down, spin down, so that would be something like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So, psi 0, 0, 0 would be a complex number, and I would consider, I would uh, represent this complex number as having this block and putting in this index 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, just by plugging some zeros there. That would be this. And now we said that for tensor networks, this tensor can be written in terms of smaller tensors. These are these smaller poles that are here. Each of them has one of these indices, these red indices. But if they have also some other indices that are represented by lines here. And these lines are connected with each other. And these are the indices that are contracted. So when you write the line that is connecting the two, two points, it means that the two tensors have, are contracted according to these lines. So for example, here, the same representation. So if I want to, go to, to, to see what is the coefficient Psi 0, 0, 0, 0, I will have to set here, put here a 0, here a 0, here a 0, plug a 0 in these red indices, and I will have to contract a tensor. This will give me a number, and this complex number will be this psi 0, 0, 0. So 
instead of just writing about coefficients and all that, so what we say is actually that the state we represent it like that, like a tensor, meaning that these are the coefficients of the state, and so that's why we can write the states in terms of these, these graphs. And so now you can have many well-known tensor networks, so the most famous ones are matrix product states, in which they have what, find a one-dimensional geometry, in which, uh, so they each, the, the tensors are frankly tensors, so they have this physical index, this spin index, and the auxiliary indices that are contracted, and so you now set, fix this, this, this uh, leg to some value, for example, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, then the coefficient, the corresponding coefficient, will be the contraction of these tensors, now in which this index has been already collapsed, and so these are prime two tensors that are contracted, so these are matrices, so it would be a product of matrices, and if it goes, this index is contracted to the last, would be the trace, so it would be the trace of product of matrices, and this is why states written like that are called matrix product states, in which the coefficients can be computed, just computing traces of products of matrices. Mm -hmm. Now, this has a one-dimensional geometry, and people in Connect have used it for many years in order to represent one-dimensional systems, to describe one-dimensional system in equilibrium. So now you can think of higher dimensional representations or generalizations of that, and that's what gives you these steps, which now, for example, for two dimensions, you will have a, a frank tensors with one physical index, this is the red, which is going up, and the auxiliary indices, these are the blue ones, which are coming out and that are contracted, and the same thing. So if I would set here, so S1, S2, S3, then I will have to contract all the other indices, and it will give me a complex number, which will be the function corresponding, or the coefficient corresponding to the configuration that I write here. You can have some other geometries, so one of them would be a MERA, in which you also represent a kind of one-dimensional system, in which you have some unitary transformations of these, 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 so these are the physical indices, then you have some <coughs> other tensors, which are contracted according to these lines, and now you choose this tensor with certain properties. So, for example, it's a unitary operation that's an isometry that you get an MERA. If you would only have the yellow tensors here, it would be a tensor three state. So, there are many, many of these tensor grids, and each of them have their own characteristics. Okay, so here I will talk about these steps, and so I will introduce uh, an, uh, a different notation or a different way of constructing these steps. That's the the one that we came up with together with Frank Strate many, many years ago, and this makes a connection with quantum information. It will also be useful in order to describe some of the properties. So, the idea of introducing these tensor networks is based on some quantum information ideas, basic ideas. So, one of them is what is called entanglement swapping. And entanglement swapping tells you that in order to have two particles that are entangled, so one always thinks that these particles have to interact at some moment and then they will be entangled, but actually that's not necessarily true. And so you can have to entangle, uh, you can entangle two particles that never talk to each other as long as they can interact with some other particles with themselves interacted before, okay? And so the idea is represented here. So imagine that you have here now a couple of particles, this red particle and the blue particle, and some state psi one, and here you have another red and blue particle with some other state, maybe the same state, psi 1. And so these two particles are entangled, these two particles are entangled, but these two with these two are in a product state, so they are not entangled. Now it turns out that if you project these blue particles in some entangled state, then what you will get is that the, the, I mean the, the, the particles, the blue particles, will be projected out, will be in a state that is a product state, and then with respect to these red particles, and the red particles will become entangled. So you see, even though the red particles never talk to each other, by making a joint projection here, by projecting one of these so-called maximum entangled states, then they get they get they get entangled with the means that they interact directly. So actually, this is using quantum information with quantum repeaters. Okay, so to extend quantum communication over long distances, that's basically what you do. You entangle a particle that is in some place with another one, and you send some photos that are entangled with these particles. And then you make a measurement in this, in this, with these two photons, and then the two particles that here become entangled. So, okay, so now let's use this idea and concatenate and see that in this way we can understand how these steps are constructed. So, let's take now, for example, a five partite state, which has two, uh, four blue particles and one red particle, another five partite state, 
exactly the same step with another five particles, blue particles and the red particles. And imagine now that I project, so I, I project these two particles on this maximally entangled state. What will be the state that I have? Well, first of all, these two particles that I projected will be in some projected state. I will not write them anymore because it's a trivial state. And so what remains are the particles that are not projected. But now, because I mm -hmm. make this entanglement swapping now, these four particles and four particles will be entangled. So again, we have five particles. I project one of them, then the rest of the particles will be entangled with each other because of this entanglement swap. And now what we can do is that we can just continue doing that. This is what I told you before. I start with this, this state of five particles, and I put two copies. I do that, and then they get entangled. Now I could put another copy on top and do the same procedure, and I will have no more particles entangled, and I can continue like that. Yes, see, there, there were five particles, five particles, five particles, five particles, and the blue particles are in between. I have projected out. So now we'll have a state of all these particles that are entangled. So there are the red particles in the center, there are the blue particles in the boundary, and there is no particle in between because I have projected them out, and I say that I don't draw them. And now I can continue. I can take another column of those and also project the particles that are in between. And so now I will have red particles in the interior, blue particles around, everybody will be entangled with everybody, and uh, the particles at the center are eliminated. And if I continue doing, doing like that with many columns, at the end I will have a set of red particles at the center, a set of blue particles on the side, everybody entangled with each other. And now at the end, so what I can do is that I can either project the particles that are at the boundary in order to have only a single state for the particles of the red particles, or I can project the particles that are at the top and the bottom again. And in this case, I will have something that has a cylindrical symmetry, or I can project the particles that are on top and bottom, and also independently the ones that are on the left and on the right. And in this case, I will have state on the torch. So I will have, I will have created a state which is translationally invariant in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction, because in the way that I build is completely symmetric. So in particular, this way that I told you is a, is a way of creating states that are, first of all, translational invariant. So you choose just this state side. So if this five particle state is always the same, then the reason you see that you have a state that is translational invariant, and it will be entangled because of this entanglement swapping that I used before. So you have uh, a multi-contact entanglement state, which is, which is, and, which is uh, <coughs> in this way. But what is important is that everything will depend only of my original state. So if I tell you what is my original state, if I give you this five part by state, the state of the red particle and the blue particle, then the state that I constructed will depend only on this part state. So all the information about this many of these states is only on this five part on this five part state. Okay, and it's very easy to see that this construction actually fulfills the area law. So if I construct for any state that I take, I make this construction and I take a piece of uh, a piece of, of, of this system and I look at the entanglement between this piece and the rest, it would fulfill the area law. It's a bit more difficult or much more difficult to show the, the, the converse. Okay, so you give me a state that has an area law, then I can write it like that. For that, there are some mathematical theorems, I will not enter into that, but the basic picture is that. Uh, at least you have any final temperature, huh? then this will, uh, the state that you will have at any final temperature can be well approximated to an error of epsilon with this construction. And the price that you will have to pay is that your fiducial state, the state psi one which you start with, will have these blue particles, will have a dimension which only grows polynomially with the size of the system. So you lose the exponential dependence, you get the polynomial dependence. But this can be a bad polynomial, that is, okay, n to the power six or, or whatever. Okay, so so what is the connection with this construction and tensor networks? Well, this construction depends on this fiducial state, and if you write this fiducial state in some basis, now since there are five particles, there will be here a coefficient in front, which will have five indices, so you can consider as a tensor. <coughs> so actually, the coefficient of the state in this basis, in some particular basis has this red particle and the blue particles, will have five indices, so it can be represented as a tensor. And actually, this construction that I gave here is, you think, I mean, projecting into this maximal entangled state in all the boundaries, 
is like making some contraction between the tensors, and so this gives you exactly this, this correspondence between tensor networks, so written in this with this language, and this PEPS, which is written in, in this language. Is there any particular reason why you think about one of the reasons the S index? Right, right. The, the S will be the physical index. So this is the original one. So I give you, I have a many body state where you have some indices, and this is the one that I single up, and the other ones are auxiliary indices. And these are the ones that I use in order to, con to construct, and they disappear from the construction at the end. Yeah? Actually, one can very clearly show that if you give me any other state which is not the maximally entangled, I can always obtain the same state if I use a maximally entangled state and change my fiducial state. Therefore, with a loss of generality, you can consider to be the maximally entangled. They are related. So you give me a state with some state that is not maximally entangled and some fiducial state, I will give you another one in which this is uh, maximally entangled and another fiducial state which is exactly the same contraction. So, any other question? Okay. So now, this construction that I did, I mean, I construct in order to build states, like pure states, that you can use to build mixed states or to operators. And so the idea is that now you can have also tensors, but you will have now like the bra indices and the cat indices. And so you can build many body operators also in terms of the small tensors. You can also build maps. So for example, you can just use this tensor and leave open the indices that are at the boundary. And so now you can consider this to be a map from the red indices to the green indices or from the green indices to the red indices. So this corresponds to a bulk boundary map. And so the whole map is represented in terms of one single tensor. You can choose other geometries. You don't have to put it on a square lattice. You can take any geometry, isolate for a hyperbolic geometry, whatever geometry, and put the tensors in this geometry. And what is important for my talk is that you can, these auxiliary particles and these original particles, they don't have to be spins, they don't have to be positive, they could be fermions. And the same construction will, will follow. So these uh, tensor networks will also work for fermions, and the only difference is that this fiducial state now, these blue particles and these red particles will be fermions. And actually, that's the one that I will use most of the time, but I will not say that. Okay, but you have to have in mind, because I will talk most of the time about lattice beach theories, and so there will be matter, and there will be fermionic fields, and therefore there will be some fermionic tensor networks, but since it doesn't matter if I talk about fermions or about bosons, then I will, I will not say it every time, oh, these are fermions, these are fermions, these are fermions. These are fermions. Okay, keep it in mind. Okay, so now this was the, the introduction. So that's what I need for, for my talk. And so what I want to talk is about first gauging tensor networks. So this is related to lattice gauge symmetry, where there is some gauge symmetry. So I'll show now how you can take a tensor network for matter, and in the same way as what you do in high energy physics, that you have some matter field with a global symmetry, and then you gauge it in order to have a local symmetry, you can construct lattice gauge theories using the same way you take a tensor network only for matter, which has a global symmetry, and there is a way of introducing bosonic degrees of freedom in such a way that you promote this global symmetry to a local symmetry. Then I will use this technique of gauging to define what are we call minimal tensor networks as a specific uh, family, subfamily of tensor network states now which include matter and gauge fields, and that have the property that the contraction of the indices, when you want to compute, so at the end, when you want to compute some expectation values of physical observables, then you have to contract these tensors. It's typically difficult, but for this particular mm -hmm. family, this can be done using Monte Carlo techniques and something that you're using, or that we are using in order to go to higher dimensions. And then I will talk about something that's a little bit of, of the field of my talk, which is how you can eliminate fermions in lattice gauge theories. And so here, the idea. So until we realize that in these tensor networks, if you do this gauging that I explained, then you look at the tensors, and then you realize that it is possible to apply some unitary operation acting locally on the gauge degrees of freedom and the matter degrees of freedom in such a way that you factorize the fermionic state and you end up with a gauge theory. So there is a unitary transformation which takes your state, including fermions and matter fields, and transforms in something that contains only gauge fields and the fermions are, are trivial. And so I thought that this was a drawback of our tensor network description, so that the tensor network description that are gauged in this particular way 
they will not be good enough to describe that is gay series because we didn't expect that that is gay series would have the same property. And so what we proved is actually that that is gay series have exactly the same property. So this is a unitary transformation, a local unitary transformation in which you can just get rid of the fermions and then have only a bosonic, bosonic theory. And so that's interesting, especially for quantum computation, because in quantum computation, people try and program quantum computers. Whenever you have fermions, if the quantum computer doesn't have fermions, that spins, then you have to make translations, and there are Jordan Miller transformations that have some uh, string operators, and in this way you could get rid, for example, of these string operators in quantum computation or quantum, quantum simulation. And so at the end, I will briefly talk about going to the continuum. And so I will talk about continuous tensor networks. So we, some time ago, so we extended matrix product states together with Frank to continue what we call continuous matrix product states, which work directly in the continuum. So they're uh, especially suited for quantum field theories in one plus one dimension. And so we and some other people tried in the past to extend the description to higher dimensions. And I will tell you so what we did later in order to extend this in higher dimensions. Okay, so just let me talk about catching the tensor. So I will follow this paper here of Hagenland, Kolyen, Novichu, Kustrat, and myself that we wrote in 2015, and also some later work that we also worked together with Kuhn, uh, Molnar, Swag, and, and but there are some other papers by people in the audience here which also do some similar similar statements. Okay, so. Uh, we want to now use this tensor network description to describe uh, lattice gauge series, and we will use Hamiltonian formulation. Okay. So that was it was proposed by Kovic and Saskin in the in the 70s, and so this means that of course we break Lorentz invariance, but we're going to break it anyway because we're going to work in the lattice. And so what we do is that we go to some special trend in which we have Hamiltonian dynamics, and so at the end the whole description of the model is given by some Hamiltonian. And if we want to look at the vacuum of our theory, we'll have to find the ground state of that Hamiltonian. And since we have uh, uh, matter and big fields, so we represent with this Kovut and Saskin uh, description. So you represent in a lattice your the system, and you put at the vertices of your, active, of your lattice your matter fields of fermionic degrees of freedom. And at the edges of the lattice, you put the bosonic degrees of freedom to represent the gauge fields. So now, in terms of networks, so what we do is we represent states. So this means that we would like to represent what are possible ground states of these problems, so that is gauge theory. So we'll have states described in terms of these tensor networks. So for example, in two plus one dimension, this would be something like that, one of these steps written like that. And so what we do is that, again, so we take the lattice and we put tensors at the vertices of the lattices, and this would correspond to the fermionic degrees of freedom. These are the two tensors. And then we put different tensors at the, at the edges of the lattice, of the links of the lattice, sorry. And these are these green tensors, which would represent the, the matter fields. And all of them have the physical degrees of freedom. So this red, and this one here would be a fermionic degree of freedom. And this one here would be a bosonic degree of freedom. And these tensors are very different on nature because, in, for example, the blue tensor, since this is at the vertex, has five indices here, whereas the other one has only three. And also the bosonic and fermionic. And so what we're assuming here, is that these auxiliary particles that we use in order to do the state, they are fermionic, and that's no problem because out of fermions, then you can construct bosonic degrees of freedom. So just using fermionic degrees of freedom for these auxiliary particles makes it completely general. Okay, so now we want to impose that that's a gauge theory, so it has, uh, how, how do we make it gauge invariant? So how can we choose these tensors, these green and blue tensors, in such a way that we have a gauge invariant? So this invariant from there. Gauge transformation. So somebody gives me some group, this would be the gauge group. And so what I want is that whenever I act, so in this language, so gauge invariant means that whenever I act on the on one of these uh, uh, tensors or one on the on the, on the uh, fermionic degrees of freedom at one vertices and the bosonic degrees of freedom around them, I have a unitary transformation here, then the state is invariant. So it's a symmetry which is local, it's only acting in some region, then the state is invariant under that. And so this means that I have uh, some representation <coughs> for the uh, fermionic degrees of freedom, this is this QG, and some representation for the bosonic degrees of freedom, these are these QG, left and right, and have 
abelian group. And so it means that this state is invariant under this transformation. And since the state is invariant, it's a rational invariant, you import that this invariant is one of these uh, places and it will be invariant everywhere else. So how, we make, how do we make sure that by choosing the tensor that we have, we have this property, that the state that we have is invariant under this local transformation? And well, the first thing that you can realize, so there's something that we call fundamental theorem of tensor networks, so it was proven here for, for two dimensions, or even higher dimensions, is that if you have this condition, actually it should be fulfilled just if you forget about everything else except for tensors that are in this corner. So it means that it should be true like it's written here. So if you put this tensor and leave open the blue indices, the state should still be invariant under this transformation. And let me just now work a little bit out. So what this condition means, and let me first go to one plus one theory because it's the simplest way of understanding what is happening. So what we want in is in one dimension. So if we have a matrix for that state, again, with this, this would be the matter. So for unit, if it's a freedom and this would be the gauge field, we want that if we apply some unitary transformation to these three indices, the state remains invariant. And it's very easy to see that this is an if and only if this condition is fulfilled. So whenever I apply this unitary transformation on my fermion, uh, uh, modes, then it has to be the same thing as applying some other transformation to these indices that are here at the boundary. So, so about plugging something, some unitary transformation in the physical index has to be the same thing as applying some other transformation in these auxiliary indices. And at the same time, if we apply this unitary transformation in the physical index of the bosonic <coughs> degrees of freedom, then it should be the same thing as applying on one side of the auxiliary degree of freedom. And if we apply the other one, so the right, then it should be the same thing as applying on the left. And you can really see here very easily that if I apply, if I have a state like that, I apply this use here, and I use these rules. So first of all, this u will be replaced by x and y minus one. Then this green one would have an x minus one to the right, which will cancel this one here when I put it together. And the one that is here then will spit out some <coughs> y, which will, when I contract, will cancel this one here. So if we take this u, apply these rules, we will get something like that. So indeed, if I have if I have tensors that fulfill this property, then this will be fulfilled. What is not easy to see is that that is necessarily sufficient, so that there is no other way that this can be satisfied. Yeah. So I need to see this as a state. Group. So this this also has a global state. I mean, I guess no, 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 no. I have to go that it has a global state. I say it's not at all. At the moment, at the moment, I say, okay. So somebody, I mean, I want to construct some state for some lattice gauge theory, and I want to impose that it has a local symmetry. Then we follow out. We will follow that I must have some global symmetry. But at the moment, there is just a local symmetry. Right, but I, I'm just reading the first equation that is implying that there's also a global Like, if I have a free zone on the index, it will disappear and triple this, right? Well, but then you, you have to have, you, see, you apply here, <coughs> u here. You apply it again here, the u, and the u, you have u squared somewhere here. So, it will disappear unless u squared. Oh, yeah, the the you have to apply the three. So, I'm imposing for the three. For the three is true, for the one for one is not true. But are you saying this is going to imply that this NPS has a global symmetry? That's right. Well, what will happen now is, is that when I don't write this green tensors, if I put only matter, then you will have to see this. This will come out. Oh, okay, so I have to get rid of the of the boson in degrees of freedom, and only matter degrees of freedom will have a global symmetry. That's what I'm aiming at. Okay, but for the moment, yes. So if I want to build a state which has local symmetries, then the tensors have to fulfill this condition, where these x and y are some invertible matrices. So one can show that they are representations of the same group, etc., etc. But then you have to get And this is also guaranteed that they gave Well, for the moment, I'm talking about the states. I'm not talking about Hamiltonians. This is just the states. Okay, I will talk about Hamiltonians later on, and then we will, we will come. That comes from the just a bit. So somebody gives me one tensor network, 
and I want to check if it's getting buried, if it has a symmetry. And if it doesn't fulfill what I tell you, then it will not be able to have to check anything. So the condition for the global symmetry is that this x and y are equal, and that specifies that some particular u, like lower, lower. That's right, that's right. So I'm coming to that. Okay, okay. let me go. <laughs> okay, so now what happens in higher dimension? So this can be proven in, uh, in, in one dimension. So now you go to higher dimensions, actually, this has not been proven. So for the moment, there's not something like a theorem that tells you that you want to have symmetry, then you must have kind of the same. Uh, same condition. So, but people what have done, they might want some of the people we, is that we say, okay, but let's do it the other way around. So, if we have a condition like that, then automatically we must have a symmetry. Okay? So, now I will forget about left and right indices to make the notation not so cumbersome, but I mean, have to have, have in mind this could be non abelian or, or whatever theories. And so, now what is true is that if I fulfill so if I choose my tensors in higher dimension in such a way that u is equal to some b and b daggers like it's expressed here, and the other tensor, the tensor corresponding to the gauge field, if I apply the u to some other u, then it splits the v on one of the sides, then automatically I will have this condition that I mentioned before, which is necessarily sufficient because if I apply the u's everywhere here, so each of them, I mean, this will send these u's and r and the b's. So, so this is out, and they will be cancelled by the green parts. So at the end, I have this invariant. So it's clear that if I have tensors fulfilling this condition, then automatically I will have that my state is uh, has this uh, local symmetry. But now you can see, and now this is what you said before. So if I have this condition, then what happens if I put together now? If I get rid of the green degrees of freedom, and I put only, I would construct a matter state, only with the blue tensors. Okay, so you gave me the blue and the green tensors, I get rid of the green tensors, and I put on the, the blue tensors, so it means that I have a fermionic state, I have something like that, but since you have this property, it's very easy to see that then you have a global symmetry, because you apply U everywhere, then, because of this condition, then in one tensor, the U's and the V's that appear will be cancelled by the next one, by the next one, the next one, and if you're in the torus, all of them will be cancelled, so it means that you have a global symmetry. So your state of matter only, that you construct with the tensors, with the original tensors, you have this global symmetry. And so this gives you a recipe to construct now lattice gauge theory. Just do it the other way around. So, I mean, let's copy what people do in high energy physics. High energy physics, what you have now, so I'm saying, now I'm going to Hamiltonians, so you have a Hamiltonian in high energy physics where it's only for fermions, then if this Hamiltonian has a global symmetry, then you can gauge it, you can convert it, promote it to local symmetries just by including some other degrees of freedom. These are these green degrees of freedom, which are the gauge fields, in such a way that now there is a Hamiltonian which has this local symmetry. And typically do it by minimal coupling, but we can do exactly the same thing. So the corresponding version in terms of tensors is that you build a state which has a global symmetry for matter. That's the state here. You choose these tensors having this property, you build the state for matter. And once you have the state, you can gauge it. So you introduce some other degrees of freedom, some other tensor that have this property, and then you're sure that the state that you will get at the end will be gauge invariant. And actually, that's something that we used a couple of years ago to build toy models of tensor networks for two plus one dimension. And so what we did is we said, okay, so now let's take the simplest tensor, the simplest matter tensor. Let's include the global symmetry plus the symmetry, for example, which is rotation symmetry. And let's, let's also use a stagger, a stagger uh, configuration. And now let's gauge it. And at the end, it turns out that the simplest tensor depends only on five parameters. You can parameterize all possible tensors having these gauge symmetries with five parameters. Of course, you can make them more difficult. There will be more parameters, but the simplest family is the one that have this, I mean, these auxiliary particles are the simple fermions. These are the simplest ones, so they have very few parameters. And now you can, since the tensors, so the whole many of the states can be parameterized by five parameters, then you can look as a function of these five parameters what are the phases that you have. But now we use techniques from tensor networks in order to check as a function of the parameters if there are phase transitions and so on. And so this is a typical phase diagram. It's another phase diagram. So I don't want to, to tell you, like, because that's not the point of my talk. But then, I mean, we look at the transfer matrix, and the transfer matrix is calculated, and we say that there's a phase transition, we identify some phases, and we saw that there is a right 
rich variety of physical behaviors of this confinement, confinement, screening, etc., etc., this sort of full on chase, etc., etc. And so this was a demonstration that somehow, in this way of constructing tensor networks, you get toy models that represent the physics that one would expect for this kind of, 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 of lattice physics. But this is a toy system. It's not that we took the Hamiltonian of QED or QCD and that we found a good approximation in terms of tensor networks. No, we built some tensor networks and plot as a function of the parameters of these tensor networks, what is the phase diagram? But the fact that this is the same of these are fermions never appears. No, 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 it doesn't appear. So, so actually, I mean, we have to use it when, when we program these things, I mean, to do these plots, it appears. It appears because these fermions that are there, you have to contract them, and then there are signs and, and things like that, and so you have to take care about that. But there are systematic ways of it, for example, is uh, an expert on that, he will talk about the Munich power models where you, when you have to deal with fermions, but he has some techniques. So that could also be the view that this could, this could be the ability model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This could be this could, exactly. So it could, it could be the ability model. Okay. All right. So now I go to the next uh, step, which is uh, minimal depth. And so I go back to the way in which we gauge the the fermionic the the, 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 the matter by introducing some bosonic degrees of freedom. And actually, there's something that I didn't mention, but in high energy physics, that's what people do. It's in fact that the theory for matter, which you start with, is not only that it has a global symmetry, but it also corresponds to free fermions. Okay, so what you do is that you have free fermions, and then when you gauge them, then of course they interact with the gauge field, and then the fermions will be non interacting through the interaction with the gauge field. Well, electrons, it's a interact because they exchange photons. And so actually, we can we can do the same thing. So we can now say, well, what happens if instead of starting with a theory, let's say only including fermions of interacting fermions, of a ground state of interacting fermions and gauging, we take a theory of free fermions and we gauge it. And so what are the states that we get? And so that's what we did in this work. And so what we did is exactly the same: take a state of matter, but now corresponding to free fermions. So the tensors that we choose here are corresponding to free fermions. And we know how to do that because some time ago, we wrote a paper of how to describe these fermionic peps, but also fermionic peps corresponding to Gaussian theories. So in a sense, the many body state we impose that is a Gaussian state, so it can be written in terms of the Gaussian operators in creation and annihilation operators, which are the fermionic operators acting on the different lattice sites, acting on the vacuum. And the idea of how you can do that, or how we must do that, in the language of tensor networks, is that you have to take the fiducial state you start with to be Gaussian, so itself will be written like that, and that's it. Because see, if this state that you take the fiducial state is Gaussian, then this projection that you do is also a Gaussian operation. So you can write it as an exponential sum Gaussian, and you see that whenever you do things that are Gaussian, then the rest what you, what, what, what you obtain is Gaussian. And so this way, actually, the, what you will have at the end will always be. So this means that the only thing that we have to do is to take the, above the description that I had before and impose that the initial tensor that we have corresponds to a fiducial state which is Gaussian. And so that's what we did. Yes, take that. And once we have this Gaussian, then we, we gauge it and gauge, we take a, a general, a general uh, 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 bosonic tensor there. And so if we do that, then, okay, so let me just introduce some compact description to tell you what happens. So actually, then you can write this many body state actually as a, as a, as a path integral, but since this is in the lattice, this means that we are summing with respect to all possible configurations of the gauge field. You take a phase of the gauge field, so for example, for you want you to take a phase, and then you take all possible configurations at each point, and for each configuration, you freeze the state for this configuration, and then you write what is the state for the fermions, and what you have is that the state of the fermion is then one many body state of the fermion is one of these Gaussian states that depends on the field configuration. So that is what is represented here. So the state can be written as a sum with respect to all possible configurations of your gauge fields, the state of the gauge field, and one of these fermionic Gaussian state that depends on the configuration of the field. Of, of the field. And so this is what happens when you do this construction. You can represent it like that. And if you can represent it like that, it means that if you compute 
expectation value of some observable, let's take for simplicity some observable for the gauge field, and some observable that depends on the, on the phase, so for example, some Wilson loop operator, then it will have this form, but it's the orthogonal, and you see that that's something that can be sampled. So this quantity that is the norm, this is something that is positive, this is something positive. I mean, this is a function that you can compute, and this is a scalar product between two fermionic Gaussian states. But the scalar product between two fermionic Gaussian states can be efficiently computed, contracted. You can make this contracted from the fermionic states, then you can contract. Uh, so it means that you can compute probability for each configuration efficiently, and therefore you can sample. So the idea now is to use this in order to build theories in two plus one dimension and three plus one dimension, and to the problem that we have numerically, which is to contract these tensors, it will not contract. We sample them using Monte Carlo. I'm sorry, I think Gaussian states are sufficient. Huh? Is that the are sufficient? I mean, what this, this is a construction. So this is a subset of all possible states. Okay, so we will have some subset of it will be corresponding to interacting, but we don't include all the states contained in the area at all. But what we want to try is whether those are sufficient numerically to describe uh, the, the many body system. That's why in this way we can at, at least attempt to go to three dimensions, three plus one dimensions, and that's what, what we're trying. But it's not clear that it's that, that it's sufficient. However, since we built it in this way, <laughs> motivated by Hermit physics, by taking free fermions and gauging them, then we hope that this would be I mean, a good indication that this would I, I have the same question I mean I mean we could do this construction of the Gauss and say it's always looked at this as a very different fix one say how, how are you going to run to a strongly coupling? No 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 but this is a strongly coupling. I mean there is coupling here because there are the gauge fields. So the gauge fields are there and provide the uh, non-trivial non-Gaussian interaction. So so the theory is non-Gaussian. The theory is non-Gaussian. So it's only that we build so it's like if you if I ask you, let's take I mean a a, a field theory, I mean, QCD or whatever. How do you write it? You start with some action corresponding to free fermions, and then you gauge it, and then there are interacting fermions. But you start with an action which are free fermions. We do the same thing. We start with a tensor of free fermions, we gauge it, and this corresponds to interacting fermions. The only thing is that we start with some particular action or some particular state which are free fermions. It's the same thing. You could, I could ask you the same thing you could do in higher energy physics. Not start with free fermions, with some interacting fermions, just take a Hauer model and gauge it. But you don't do that, you start with free. But can you see the object flow then in this picture? I mean, there should be an object flow, there should be a Well, if, I mean, if we include Hamiltonians and we could, then we will see what we what we can see. So at the moment, what we have done is this, this calculation. So, so this original paper, what we did is that we took now a 10 by 10 lattice and we use a parameterization which was the same that I showed you in the plot before. So it turned out that the states that we built before actually belong to this to this family, the stoic model that I took before. And so now we use this Monte Carlo simulation, and the only thing that we use is that we use a C3 instead of a U1 for, for this for this model. Yeah. But, uh, so these fermions, in fact, are not higher fermions. No. So you've got a solution from right, and that is why you have a positive measure. Because otherwise, the gauge will distinguish a couple different to the left. Well, I mean, the problem is that. Then you then you would end up with a, with a with a phase factor that you would not generically cancel because you have an anomaly. Okay, so yeah, but you're bringing me to the to the to the field of I mean, taking about actions and to do. Uh, if I was something that there there isn't a phase factor. That there isn't these both the numerator and the denominator are nice positive definite simple things. Sample is because there isn't the, the gauge field couples to, in the same way to the left handed and to the right handed. Well, I mean, here there are not left handed and right handed that, fermions. That's, that's the point. So, but if I would put, then probably I will have to write a product state of the left handed and right handed. And then if I, well, no, but if I put the, 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 the left and the right, I will have here a product state of the left and the left and the right and the right. And so this would be possible. But the gauge, the gauge field would not be distinguish which was the left and which was the right. But it will, the gauge field yeah. would not, if, if, if the representation of the, of the fermions yeah. were, were not a level three, yeah. then the gauge field would distinguish, would couple differently. There would be a 
two left and the two right. But it's two left. When, when you couple, when you put the minimal couple in, you get two left and the two right. Yes. And if two left were not equal to two right, then there would be a mismatch. There would be an extra phase that. Okay, maybe, right. maybe. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I understand because I'm not coming from that field. Maybe may well be, but we can talk about that. Okay, so the question is that now we can use this in order to compute expectation values for higher dimensions. And so that's the, I mean, in this first paper, neither Perez nor me are experts on, on the programming. So we program something simple, a 10 by 10 lattice. And so we try to reproduce the results that I showed you before. So I showed you before that we took some hedge theories and then we parameterized them and then we got the phase diagram. So here we did the same thing, but instead of taking a U1 uh, hedge theory, we took a set three phase theory because then we have three states only at the, at the edges and it's much easier to sample than the whole phase. And so that's what we did. So what we plotted here now is, for example, the Wilson loop across one bracket or a Wilson loop according to the whole torus. And this distinguishes some, some phases. So here you can see that there's a function of some of the parameters. Some of the Wilson loop, I mean, makes something weird. So, I mean, we assume that then there is phase transition here. And if we do this plot and look at the phases, then we see that there are A, B, C, D phases, like before. And in fact, this looks very much the same or very similar to what we had before with this new theory. And in fact, when you're plotting only this corner, so you see that this corresponds to this prime corresponds to this prime, this to this, this corresponds to this, and this bar corresponds to this, to this bar. So with this method, what we check is that in a lattice of 10 by 10, then you can recover what, I mean, we couldn't do in a 10 by 10 lattice before, because I mean, the, the numerical method exploded, but now we can do here. So Patrick Emmons here with uh, my Carmen, and um, Edis, now they're trying to do bigger systems with that and to include on a billion and, and so on. And so that's some part of the research that we're doing. Yeah. Here, the one dimension is two. Here, the one dimension is two, but you can do it for yeah. arbitrary one dimension. So actually, this is what now happens. They're taking not toy models, they're taking now, let's say, uh, uh, U1 uh, QED, and, and then for that one, Writing these expectation values, computing the energy, and minimizing the energy with respect to all the parameters, all these tensors, in order to see whether you can approximate the existence. And the goal would be to go to three dimensions, three plus one dimension, and to and to and to include also non-abelian symmetries. Okay, so now I move on to eliminating fermions in elastic the series. Some other work done with Eric a few months ago. And okay, so let's go back to this transparency. So this tells me so how to build this uh, petroleum that you want to build the theories which have these gauge symmetries. You could choose your tensors having this property and the, the, the bosonic tensors having this property, and this will ensure that your state has a gauge symmetry. But what we realize, well, actually, and and so there was but as I mentioned before, in one plus one dimension, then you can, I mean, find that this is a necessary sufficient condition. And actually, what we did in this paper is a full contraction for all groups and so on. And in this paper of Borello and so on, what they did is a simple contraction. It's not a full contraction, but they say, okay, so we know how to solve these, these, these equations in some particular way. So they found some constructive solutions. And now what we realize is that if you take these solutions, so you construct these tensors in the way they propose, then they have the following property. So you just look at them and you see that there is a unitary transformation that acts on this gauge and fermion degree of freedom, and this entangles the fermionic degrees of freedom. And so we thought that it was uh, a bug of this construction. Um, and so we thought that, therefore, I mean, this, this, this is a very big constraint for the tensor network that we construct, is like they will have this property, and this property is not the property that the gauge theories have. But actually, with strand strand, many years ago, we wrote a paper that we showed that you have a Fermi, a Fermi power model, uh, so uh, some model in two dimensions for Fermi, it is always possible to find, to add some particular degrees of freedom and to find some unitary transformation in such a way that you can convert it to some bosonic degrees of freedom. And so we thought that maybe here it is possible to do something similar. And actually, we managed to do that. So we showed that it is possible for any lattice gauge theory to find some local transformation in which, at the end, you will end up with a trivial theory for the fermion 
and the theory would you have replaced the fermions by hardcore bosons. And so there's a theory only for bosons, and it's unitarily really equivalent to the original one. And so this has some consequences. So first of all, I mean, you want a good now describes the, let's say uh, fundamental theories without any talking about fermions, just talking about bosons. The second thing is for quantum computing, this is what I mentioned before. So it means that now if I have any problem that is a series, I can formulate it in terms of bosons, which are local, the theory is local. So in a quantum computer, I don't have to pay the overhead related to the fact that I have to describe the fermions with spins, so for the bigger uh, uh, tails. Also for analog quantum simulation. So there are people trying to build not only quantum, quantum computers, but to have, for example, atoms in optical lattices in which you tune interactions, essentially that emulate the physics of some system. And with atoms in optical lattice, in principle, it's possible to emulate the physics of lattice based theories because you can use bosonic and fermionic species of atoms, which would describe the bosons and the fermions. But with some other quantum simulator, it's impossible. You take trap ions, then they're spins, they are not fermionic. And you take, for example, superconducting qubits, they're there are spins, so there is no way that you have fermions there. And this would mean that they could do this quantum simulation in another way from these systems. And so the hope is that maybe this also has some implications in, in Monte Carlo that we don't have to deal with fermions, but we don't know what to talk about that. Okay. So, I mean, this is a, it's a little bit technical now, but let me tell you what, are, what is the idea in any dimension. So, let me tell you what, what is the idea. So, I have to be a little bit more specific now. So, I will talk about general discrete So, no tensor networks now. Okay, so that's just now the, the language of, of classic B theory with the Hamiltonian formulation. When you have a Hamiltonian, you have a lattice with the vertices. Again, you have your the matter degrees of freedom, primary degrees of freedom, and the, and the links, you have your bosonic degrees of freedom, these are the spin dots here. And the Hamiltonian, so typically has a Hamiltonian that corresponds to the matter. Which is acting on the, on the particles only at the, at the vertices. So, this would be, for example, the master of your theory. Then, there is a field, Hamiltonian, which typically has an electric part which acts on the links and the magnetic part which acts on plaquettes. And it has an interaction, and this corresponds to something that is here. So, a fermion can hop from one place to the next one, and it interacts with the bosonic field, which is in between. And with all these models can be written in this form. And then there is a pitch group, okay, which means that in these systems there is some symmetry corresponding to some representation of this field. It's actually that if you act in one cross, like this one here, and you act on the green particles and the red particles, then the Hamiltonian remains remains in place. That's the same thing as before, now, but with the Hamiltonian formulation. Okay, so the claim that we have with is this, and this is what I want to show you. So I can build a unitary transformation. And this unitary transformation is a unitary transformation which will act on some plaquettes. So we will act on this plaquette here. There will be another acting on this plaquette, on this plaquette, these five particles. Then another one, these five particles, a product of five particles everywhere. And this, each of them is a unitary transformation. <coughs> each of these unitary transformations commute with each other. So it doesn't depend the order in which you apply. In such a way that if you apply this unitary transformation, then at the end you have the new Hamiltonian is local, it's still local. Uh, there are no more fermions, so there are hardcore bosons there. And still you have a gauge theory, so it means that there are some local symmetries in the new. Let me show you how to do that. And as I told you, it's a little bit technical, so I wanted just to present what are the main ideas of this transformation. And so, so the first thing. Is we are going to introduce now two kinds, two new types of fermions. So it will be type one fermion and type two fermions. So the type one fermion will be associated to the vertices. This is this yellow particle that I do. So there is the red and the green particles as before. So this is one of the crosses. And so there is the red, the original fermionic particle, the red and the green, these are the which are the links. But now I introduce more particles. And this will be auxiliary. And so you see they will be eliminated later on. But at the moment, it would be for the construction. And so the yellow particle is just a normal fermionic particle. So C, C dagger is equal to that, the anti commutator is equal to one. So each, each link I introduce one of these particles, which is this kind of some annihilation operator C. And then I introduce another four particles. These are Majorana fermion particles, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which are these blue particles here. 
meaning that, for example, Alpha's political identity and that uh, uh, Alpha beta anti communication is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the first step. So to introduce new particles. Then the next thing is that out of these particles, I make composite particles. Okay, so for example, I take the, the yellow particle that I introduce, and the first thing that I do is that I define a Majorana operator. So C, C dagger is some operator. So Majorana operators, I will write them with Greek letters. So this is psi. So now there is a psi operator in here. And now out of this Majorana operator and the original fermion operator of the red particle, I built another operator. This is this eta operator, which is Majorana operator corresponding to the yellow particle and a Dirac operator corresponding to the red particle. And as you can see, this eta is a bosonic operator. In fact, it's a hardcore boson operator because eta squared is equal to zero. Right? Because if I put eta times eta, there will be a squared and a is a normal operator is equal to zero. And eta at different sides commute with each other. So these are bosonic eyes. Both, therefore, that the chi and the A uh, they anti commute, yeah, yeah, they anti commute. These are fermionic particles that anti commute. That is because chi square is equal to one, one, but yeah. A square is equal to zero. zero right. So it's, it's not obvious that the chi and A should have. No, no, but if I, if, no, 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 no. So it's a hardcore boson, meaning, first of all, that eta square is equal to zero. That is very simple. Zero. And the second one, if you have Psi and A, and Psi prime and A prime, they commute. It's very clear because they don't have to do with each other. And when you have two fermionic operators that have nothing to do with each other, they commute. So that's come to the rule that Chi and A, uh, are they, Chi and A are they will anti commute up to some uh, phase, then you get a phase that will travel. Okay. 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 So that's so the, the second thing is that we define with this auxiliary part of this yellow particle. And the red particle that is supermutic will be defined to homosonic operator. That's the second step. And the third is that we introduce also these Majorana particles. You see, there are the links. And so we take a Majorana particle here at the link, and another one and the next link, and we build a fermionic operator with them. You see that I can define now a fermionic operator as alpha plus i gamma, alpha coming from the left and gamma from the right. And I do the same thing with the vertical directions. These are just definitions. Okay. And so now what we have is an enlarged Hilbert space because I have introduced new particles. I have the physical space corresponding to the red and the green particles. That's the box space that we started with. But we have now some space for the other particles. And so what I will define is the vacuum for the state, which is the one that is annihilated by this C and by the F. So what I say is that okay, let me start with the Hilbert space, imposing that the particles that I've introduced are in the vacuum of the operator that I had just defined, the C, the original C, and the F that I defined in this way. So now my Hilbert space is clear because the original one, tensor product, something which is single state, the dimension one Hilbert space, and some other tensor one Hilbert space. Okay, so the second the step is to identify electric parity operators at the link. Okay, so now I have to tell you that for this gauge series, what is the form of this interaction, Hamiltonian? So interaction Hamiltonian corresponds to fermions, which is moving from one side to another one, has an A and an A dagger. So it's A right, so some fermion appears from here and appears here. And then we apply some operator U here at the center, that we call Sasskun. So, uh, for the asking uh, uh, interpretation. And now, of course, this, I mean, this A could be, it's a, it's a, it's a spinner, it could have many components, so I have to write that. And now, what I want to find is some operator that lives here, P, which anti commutes with this U. Okay, so, I have to find some operator P that anti commutes, and that can be written as E to the I pi, I pi E, where E is a compact operator, it has to have an integer spec. So basically what I'm doing is saying, identify an electric field there, and I build a parity operator with this electric field that actually commutes with my unitary transformation there. <coughs> and so what it means is that if I apply u and e to the i pi electric field, it's the same thing as taking e to the i pi e plus one times u. This, the commutator will tell you that the electric field goes by one if I anti-commute. 
useful later on. Actually, it's trivial to show that this operator always exists if I have a gauge uh, group which is UN or SU2N. And because it's a subgroup C2 there, and you can build it without tapping on the subgroup. And if you have something like S is U3 or something like that, it does not exist as an operator. But what you can do, and I'm not going to talk much about that, is that you can include, introduce yet another C2 field at the edge, okay, which is also trivial, you put it in the vacuum, and you use this C2 in order to have this property. Out of this new field, you find some electric field. So it means that you have some other auxiliary particles there, which will be a trivial one, a C2 field. And from this one, you build this bit. That's also that's also possible. So that's it. Just, just, just to say, it, like we've been going for one hour, and that's no, like, sorry. Uh, no, no, that, 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 that's fine. And there's no, 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 no. But like uh, I would suggest that we do like to finish like the discussion like in about two minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Because I'll go a little bit faster. So now what you do is that you build. You build. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so now I can define my unitary transformation. So what I do is that the unitary, I write the unitary transformation as a product of unitary transformations which act on each of these vertices, and all these particles, and they are product themselves of four dimensions in five dimensions of six and so on. And so I build them in terms of these operators that I built. So, for example, the V1 that appears here is I C, so this yellow, times alpha, this Majorana operator, to the power E1, where this is the E that I identified here. And the same thing for the rest. It's very easy to see that they, they, they commute with each other because only this is the common, the only thing that is common for all this, all this operator is the E, but there's a single operator here, so it will be the same. Everywhere else, you know the you know, you know the black things, and I do this unitary transformation. So I transform my Hilbert space and I transform my Hamiltonian. And if I do that, the first thing that you can see, the first statement, is that my new Hilbert space is actually the vacuum of the second time of particles, still the vacuum. So if I apply to this Hilbert space an operator f that I built before, it's annihilated. So it means that this must be the vacuum. So the vacuum. Okay factors out. So it means is that I can just project into this vacuum. And the second thing is that when I do the transformation, my operator A, whenever I have an operator A, this is the operator of the red particle, the operator that is finds the time of it, then is replaced by the operator eta times into the I E. So this fermionic operator is replaced by a bosonic operator and some other operators that appear like F dagger F. These are these particles that live in the middle, but this f dagger f, they commute with each other, so they're like classical numbers that can get rid of. I mean, this is the explanation how you, how you can get it, but at the end, the statement is that if we do this transformation, we end up with a Hamiltonian with the particle two are not there, so they we just in the intermediate construction that it disappears, and we have a Hamiltonian which is local, it can derive, it has only bosons, there is no fermion anymore. And the phases that were in the bosom now appear as e to the i electric fields, but they are local at each of the positions. Okay, so very fast. Now I'll go we'll make some statements. So that's that's an error for quantum field theory. Let's continue. And so the idea is whether we can describe now use tensor networks in order to go to the continuum to describe quantum field theories with them. And so one possibility of doing that is through tensor renormalization. So the idea is to take a matrix for I said in one dimension and take two tensors of renormalization, which actually the we wrote a paper many years ago about this renormalization theories with tensor networks. And the idea there was to take two tensors and combine it into a single tensor and continue combining, 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 and then you can look at the fixed points and so study the fixed points for this renormalization. But what you could do is just the opposite. Just go into the uh, ultraviolet. So, yes, take one of these tensors and go backwards, divide it in terms of two tensors. This is not always possible, but if it is possible, if it is possible, then you can continue, 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 continue. And at the end, what is the limit of that? And if you go to the limit, 
Then you see that you have something that lives in the continuous. You can take mathematically this limit, and this gives rise to this continuous matrix power states that we introduced some time ago and can be written in terms of so you have a vacuum. Let's start with the vacuum of your theory. And so you have to write some operator which creates particles, and there are auxiliary particles which now are represented by some matrices Q and R, and you apply this operator of order. And if you take the trace with respect to the matrix spin arc, it's the state that you have. So that's a construction, and some people have used it to solve some, some well, address some, some models working directly in the continuum. So the idea is can you do the same thing now in higher dimensions? And it turns out that there is an obstacle for that. And the obstacle comes from the fact that if I do this renormalization that I was doing in one dimension, you see that if I take one tensor and divide it into two, still this dimension here can be exactly the same as the one in the original one. So this what we call this one dimension, so the dimension of the blue particle doesn't change. The only thing that I have to be able is to take this index and split them into two. However, in two dimensions, you try to do the same thing. So out of the tensor, you have to build four tensors. So now here, you don't have uh, 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 a single line here. You have two lines. It means that the one dimension that you have here should be a square root of D. But the square root of d has a problem that you have two. How do you take a one dimension with this square root of two? So you cannot do that unless you're in you, this is a continuous index. So this index is infinite. In this case, you can. So the only solution of taking the continuum for tensor networks in more than one dimension is to have continuous indices. So they are not longer discrete indices, but they work in the continuum. And that's what we did. So we said, okay, so let's start with tensors in the continuum. And so we use a path integral formulation. And so what this is what we did. So now that's the kind of the, the, the description. So, so the tensor here, so each of the tensors will be in a point in the space, will have like the, the physical in the physical index, and will have now fields on the side. And these fields, the contraction with each other is just a path integral with respect to some respect all possible values of the field. So that's the way which you can describe it. And so it turns out that you can now. Use the, the operator formalism, how to go from path integrals to operators, and you can write it in terms of operators. And with these operators, it turns out that at least in two dimensions, so two plus one dimensions, then you know how to use the tensor angle techniques in order to contract these tensors and to compute something. So that's something that we're working. So, what's summary of that is that indeed it is possible to define tensor networks, continuous tensor networks for field fields in higher dimensions. You lose one of the nice properties is that you work with finite dimensional systems. Now you have to work with infinite dimension, you have to go to path integral, but still the tensor network description that you use and the tensor network techniques can be applied to that. So this related for the expert to dimensional reduction. So you know when you type tensor networks, so you have this kind of dimensional reduction. So all the information about your state is at the boundary. And so you typically work at the boundary, and with that we will use. This dimension. So with this tensor, we can use the same thing. We can work with the boundary. The boundary is one dimensional system. And for this one dimensional system, we can approximate by a continuous matrix product state. That's not your question. Okay, so with that, I'd like to finish. So I talk about tensor networks. I talk about uh, several things, but maybe just uh, thank my colleagues. Thank you. I, I think that what you thought about the first amount the, the, the Gaussian state to work each time I work with a particular field. That means that essentially if I go in the lower, lower lattice, I the gradient matrix. No, but still the physical distance shows. Yeah, but this means that you think the physical distance you can think that you can. So a little, I want to make an, again this statement. Maybe it was, it was not clear. Before. So we start with a free theory of fermions, but the theory that we obtain is not free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interacting, and there is no reason why in the in the asymptotic <laughs> uh, it should be asymptotically free. Yeah, but uh, we we imagine that space is then free if I set my distance. But I still have I still have the gauge field in the middle. And this gauge field will make an interacting theory. And there is no reason why, if I, if I go to the continuum, I should get the, the 
I don't see any reason for that. So, I mean, I could tell you, so for this means that all theories are in such trees. So, no theories start with recurrence and the mutation. Yeah, but I mean, one could suggest that if you are in an anesthetic tree, you really need more. If you are in an anesthetic from not a synthetic tree theory, you get something that is not this. I didn't know what. I don't know what, but it can. Um, I don't see any more hands up. Uh, so uh, we continue in 30 minutes. So we start at 7 15. The chair is at 7 15. And the coffee is at 7 15.